they couldn't execute a, a detailed recall fast enough. So they pulled every product they had just to be safe because it was not worth the loss of human life. They recalled something like two or three Olympic sized swimming pools of flour and destroyed it. Cause there's no way you could, you could use it for anything else. Cause it was, it was great. And they couldn't figure out if it's the, the one pallet or the last six months of production. Right. Cause they had batch dispersion problems. So they recalled it all. Well, that killed all their production for several months because they had to get rid of all their back stock. Hello, we are live. Okay. And I just posted it, so we didn't do anything yeah. in advance. But so in how part. are you? How's life? Good. Just uh just living the quarantine life in the yeah. cornfields. So yeah. So do you travel quite a bit? Um, you out and about? Yes, yes and no. So okay. um, we've got um, farmers that we're working with, facilities we're working with that are in probably the five or six states around us right now. Okay. Um, so it's nice because we're going to like rural communities where COVID isn't really a big deal for a lot of those places. So um, it's funny because you, you look at um, uh, driving to like, I was in McCook, Nebraska, which is a little tiny town, middle of nowhere, um, all farm country. And it was funny because I was looking at it and was like, well, wait a minute, I got to find a, a hotel that isn't a total garbage pit that has bed bugs <laughs> and has decent cleaning. So I was like, well, I gotta, I gotta pony up for the quality in, I guess not the motel eight, you know? Or, so the, the thought process is absolutely blowing me away but um yeah we get out to all kinds of little places and um you know we've got we had a trip to oklahoma plan that we did a reschedule and then um we may be getting down to arkansas here soon and all that so it's just all over the map very cool what about personal stuff what do you enjoy doing um you know my so my girlfriend is a pt who works okay. um in Iowa, right across the river from us, and um, which is oh. interesting because they have medical use over there, and everybody that she works with uh, would be a perfect candidate for cannabis um, oh. because they're you know they have arthritis and they have bad joints and knee and hip replacements. I mean, all the things that anybody that would ever see this would would like. Oh yeah, that's a perfect person for that. Right. But because it's a Nebraska-based uh, company, and because of the way their connectivity is. They can't put patients on it and they can't recommend it to patients. So she takes care of roughly 200 different people that are all high risk for COVID. And they, they normally be coming into a facility. Well, now she's going to their houses. So whenever we go do anything, it's we go out to the middle of nowhere and we go mm -hmm. look at nature and we go do stuff, which is probably a little easier to do in Utah than it is in, uh, in Nebraska. But we went out to a place that has a giant cottonwood tree in the middle of the road. So yeah. the tree in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you guys and just drove around it. Yeah, it's 10 feet in diameter. It is this giant tree. And that was super exciting. But um, the irony is, so three or four years ago, or even 10 years ago, um, you know, driving around in the Midwest, you're just like, hey, it's the Midwest. Here's all this, here's all this stuff, all these weeds and stuff. Now that I've been in the hemp industry for a couple of years now, drive by and go feral, feral, feral. Feral, there's feral, there's, and it's it becomes that little kid who just learned a new word. Like there's hemp, hemp. There's hemp over there. Ooh, there's a big hemp stock. Ooh, that one's cool. So it's been it's been wild, but it's you know it's what you got to do. So that's awesome. It's very very cool. Well, I don't know Utah. I always wanted to play ball in Nebraska, volleyball in Nebraska, but now that I'm in Utah, I'm stuck for the mountains and the outdoor <laughs> activities, and it's so pretty. But when you talk about small towns, I'm from Wyoming. And so it was a very, I mean, I laugh that that really is our small towns everywhere yeah. we went, you know, and for sports, we traveled 45 minutes to an hour to each game. And it was not even thought of as being weird or different or unusual or inconvenient or, yeah, it's kind well, of funny. What's, what's been fun for us, especially going out to, to be with our farmer. I mean, that's what we really love. I mean, we're a tech company, so we sit behind computers all day, every day in an air conditioned apartment or office or whatever. And um, anytime someone's like, Hey, you want to come out and see my grow? Yes. Done. 
poof, gone. Yeah. And, um, so we're walking around, we're meeting people, and they are they're the salt of the earth people. It's why we got into this business because they are they want to share information, they want to share what they're doing, they want to be positive, they want to make a difference, and they once they start wrapping their head around what what we can bring to the table for them from the, the data standpoint, they go, oh, okay, I get it. And um, so when we go out and we talk to them, it's funny because everybody has that aha moment of, well, you know, like I, again, back in McCook, Nebraska, this guy has been growing uh, corn for genetics for the past 20 years or, or more. Um, so literally has, has the actual setup and everything to understand how to grow corn for genetics. And he's thinking about getting into hemp for the first time. And he and his, his brother-in-law have uh, 480 acres that they're looking at. Like, eh, corn's not so much fun anymore, but hemp's kind of cool. <laughs> and so we, we talked to him, like, all right, easy. Don't go 480 acres your first year. Like, back, easy, easy, pump the brakes. <laughs> and so we started talking to him. I was like, you know, nobody's doing a whole lot with genetics in Nebraska. You, you have a background in genetics. You could totally do hemp genetics. And he laughs. He goes, I don't have a PhD. I'm not a geneticist. I'm like, neither is the guy that you would buy seeds from. Like, not he, in this industry. No, like you, you don't need a hundred thousand dollars in college to be a genetics person in, in hemp. You just need to know how to grow the plant and respect the the Pretty biology good. and the chemistry and all that. You know, it's um, but it's been fun. That's and and they're like, well, no, I I need to have a degree or something. No, you don't. You just you need to have a passion. And uh, so it's it's been it's been great. We we jokingly say that we've we've found the happy medium from the three worlds of. You get the people that were bringing hemp forward for the last 20 to 30 years that are that are the, the hippies. You know, you get the business people that see the dollar signs. So now they're trying to run a business and they're kind of button heads with the, the hippies because they're like, well, no, it, this is a business. When you do business, this is business. Like, I get yeah. it. I, you, you sold me, but I need to run this business a little bit. And then you get the crazy science people that are PhD level smart talking about endocannabinoids and, you know, how you unlock the keys with the, I mean, it's just like, you know, and to, to blend all three together, it's just hilarious. So it's entertaining. And I always say in no other industry, I mean, in every other industry, like you said, if you're in genetics, you need a degree or a doctorate or a master's or, you know, at least. And in this industry, your farmer is also your accountant is also distributing is also growing is also you now you can experience uh speaks volumes in this yep. industry and it's there's not until recently certified education that really you know you're pulling it from other industries into this industry yep well and and so we've got a a fledgling partnership with doan university here in, in nebraska um, they have a cannabis certificate you can take online um, so they have a program that you can you can do it for free if you want and just you don't get the cert uh, but you can go in and you can do the, the training and all that, or you can pay for it and you actually get a certificate when you're done. But um, it's a it's a pretty innovative program they have. And, um, you know, Andrea Holmes, Dr. Andrea Holmes, who's running it, is super passionate about about hemp and the plant and everything like that. And so she she knows her stuff. So she's um, she actually got the first ISO certified lab here in the state of Nebraska because of her. Uh -huh. So, yeah, sure. Etsy, buddy. Etsy, Steve. <laughs> anything you can do on etsy uh, mason, mason agrees also so yeah, I, <laughs> I thought of it and i thought you know what people are gonna love this hat or they're gonna hate it oh no, we all need one and we it's just a mass order <laughs> yeah i mean it's you know no political statement or anything like that it's just funny to, to poke fun at people especially during election year so i think it's great it's uh, awesome it works <laughs> So there's so, been a lot of doom in this industry. Tell me what's good. What's going good for you guys and for the industry and the Midwest? I'm specifically interested in where you guys are. Yep. At and what's what's happening? Well, um, so we've been talking to. Uh, I won't. I won't drop the name yet. Some people on this might already know it, but we've been talking to a, a major rail carrier about moving hemp on rails and the conversations we have with them are comical i really should be recording them because they're like well who would grow something and not have a buyer for it and the the handful of people that were on the call with me we all laughed and and our contact is like that's not funny we're like no it's just it, it's hemp like people do that uh, and then but like 
So can you just put all the all the stuff in one big hopper? No. Well, that's dumb. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> so every single conversation, it's it's seeing hemp for for the first time through somebody's eyes who has dealt with major commodities, right? So beans and corn and dried animal blood and iron ore and you name it, they they move it. And um, they're like, well, that's dumb. You could just you could do this, right? No, can't do that. Why not? <laughs> State, government, rules, yeah, <laughs> rules. Well, but once you do this, then it's done, right? You never have to test it again. No, I mean it's so. I, I, they have been really, really patient, and re, and every time they turn a corner, um, they kind of get hit in the face with a with a new shocking thing. So we're we're excited to be part of that program to yeah. to help them, you know, because they don't they don't want the liability of it, you know, they the the benefit we bring is like, look, we can show you all the records that somebody needs to be compliant with hemp. We can, we can prove that it's hemp beyond what you need to have and um, makes it really easy for, for them to do that. And, you know, when you're talking, the, the metric they threw out was from LA to Denver, a hundred tons using a, a canned food model um, was less than six grand, which is ridiculous. So then that means, Supply chain wise, manufacturing facilities don't have to be as close to, I mean, for that cost, that, that still is a very small margin added to a commodity or, I mean, yeah. what I hear is that that's big windows open for availability yeah. on cost. Yeah. And then, so the, they're, they're being very good about their due diligence and um, not creating additional problems. Right. I mean, if you can start moving millions of pounds or tons even for that matter around the country like that with that kind of freedom um all of a sudden are you going to start clogging some of these facilities that that have been starving for product right i mean everyone has an operational capacity load well if i take away your supply problem and just flood with what you've got um you can run 365 days a year if you don't have the capacity at your facility to do it so um it's, it's been really, really cool working with them, and we're hopefully going to be very, very soon kind of coming forward with the, the full details of the program and all that. And, um, but, you know, it's it's been a lot of fun talking about that. And they 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 couldn't quite figure out how I knew so much about the, the railroad. And um, <laughs> truthfully, I interviewed for a job there about 10 years ago. So I did what every good employee, future employee would do, and I researched the hell out of the company. Yeah, and their stats haven't changed much. So interesting. Good for you. So, what do you see um, them being able to open up their line to transport hemp? Hemp. What does it do for them specifically? Um, so the the big thing that for them was um, they wanted to. Um, they're gonna. They you know some people have been doing it small scale. So to their knowledge, they haven't officially moved any product yet. They probably have, but they just haven't had it realized. Right. Um, but when they do that, then it's a it's another another commodity that they can move and and transport purposely. Um, that means that they're able to set pricing based on what it is, set priority. Um, they went from moving, you know, if there's ten cars, it had to wait for uh, you know enough pulling power to move that. And then they would push a load and push a load. And then you end up with, you know, 60 cars. And then all of a sudden, yeah, we can move that. And that was the way it was for, for decades, you know, centuries, maybe, well, maybe not centuries, but one at least. Um, and now they're, they're prioritizing the individual freight. So if, if there's a hot shot that needs to go from right. Omaha to, to Salt Lake, you know, they can, they can find that and they can put that on the, on the system through technology and the data. So it's pretty cool. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the, I just read Steve's comment. Let me read it first. Cause I got sidetracked as we were talking, uh, moving that much, much transport freight would be triple the cost. If they get the, if they get, can get great, wow, can get the logistics and transportation freight, this would be a game changer for the industry. Absolutely. So kind of what we were saying is, you know, the. He's playing a little insider baseball. He's talked to me about that. So he knows, he knows more than he should. So shh. 
Oh, I love it. Okay, so now I've got a question on when we talk about supply chains, you know, um, something we talk a lot about at the association and something that I'm really passionate about, especially as I've learned more about the labor and the, um, you know, textiles and, and construction and how much is exported and imported and so forth. Um, this is a huge piece for you, for the United States to be able to be sustainable on with him, with, with any, but transportation is a main vital part that really wasn't or hasn't been talked about a lot. Um, and as we're talking about putting facilities in, it's a, it's a big thing that most people bring up because of the cost added on top as the margins shrink. Um, it's a, it's a big deal. So congratulations. I'm really excited to hear this. I'm really excited that, um, Wherever it is and wherever this happens, it's a huge benefit to Utah where I'm at because of our inland port and being able to transport and manufacture out of Utah. Yeah. And what, what's interesting, so I put up in a couple different hemp groups, um, yeah. kind of a loaded question, right? So if, if you want to do anything and you want to get some good in feedback, put up something that is a little ambiguous and see who crawls out of the woodwork. So I put up on there, like, I have a, a, a freight company that can move 110 tons in a single load. Contact me for more information. And put my email. It's, and literally the idea was you should email me. Nobody emailed me. Everybody direct messaged or commented on the thread or whatever, which is fine. You know, I get it. But the people that blew me up were like, you can't do that. You're lying. Here's the maximum gross vehicle weight on a bridge. And you, that would be a 17-axle trailer. And you can't run that for that long. And you know, you're lying to people, you're unethical, and like, nope, didn't say anything about trucks, said trains, and they just they went, oh, that's totally different, and um, that was, that was hilarious, because now those people are my friends, I mean, they, they're, you know, we, we talk fairly regular with this, it's like, oh, this is totally, totally get it. But, well, and I think that that, that just goes to show where the industry's going, right, we're not talking a few acres in growth, we're talking thousands and hundreds and thousands of acres that will fulfill lots of manufacturing facilities, yeah. right? Um, what's needed? Maybe you have a better idea. You mentioned previously or last time we talked what um, some of these big orders like Patagonia look like. Now, how many acres are they looking at or what is the volume needed to fulfill an order like that so that we can kind of put into perspective yeah. really needed in our nation to fulfill, fulfill our orders? even for a few companies. Yeah, I think the, the hard part with that is I don't think the companies that are putting in, the, in those massive orders even know yet. Right. You know, the the biggest problem you'd have is I'm, you know, I'm Patagonia. I'm not, obviously, but, but wouldn't it be great to have that problem? And um, I need 40 billion yards of fabric to, to make enough to have a seasonal run of, of whatever item I'm producing. Well, the risk you run is that I can't get a million tons of it. You know, I, I come significantly short and then I have to wait to fill the rest of that order to be able to fill my line. And then I now have a hole in my in my offerings to the public and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a, a chicken and egg problem is they need to do it big enough that they can figure out if it's going to be a long term viable solution. I think most of them believe it is. But until there's enough critical mass then it's a, it's a liability almost because it's, you know, Hey, I'll, I'll promise you that I will do every single product uh, out of hemp in the next year, but I can't get enough hemp because COVID or because of the industry hasn't planted the right kind of fiber or, you know, I mean, pick any, any variable. Then all of a sudden I have shareholders that are now upset. I have orders that are going unfilled. I have loans that are coming due with no product that's been sold through to pay it off. I mean, it, it becomes a, a domino effect. And it's, it's tough. So like, um, so Lego, uh, last year, I believe is going to move all of their plastic to, uh, hemp based plastic, uh, because it's biodegradable and, and you know, everybody on, that'll see this will know why, but they're phasing it in. I believe they're not going, all right, on June 1st, it's all hemp. They're, they're going to start rolling it through and, and gradually ramp up. But as they're producing that, um, Lego produces enough plastic that they are going to probably consume everything that's growing in Europe right now. So the only way that they meet that requirement is if you can export hemp from places like the United States and the, the Caribbean and all that kind of stuff and, and get it over there. Well, the only way you can get into the European Union and the UK 
is if you have, I don't know, tracking of data points that prove that you have, you know, no heavy metals, no pesticides that are, you know, banned in Europe and all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of what we do. So that's, that's where, that's where we're, we're starting to see these, like these moments where like, we didn't mean to do that, but we suddenly figured out the, how you go from here to here. And it's been a lot of fun. Andrew says, yay, Lego. I agree. I think that, you know, them being plastic, Langdon um, touched on this a lot, right? That a lot of these big companies and big car manufacturing companies or uh, Levi or Patagonia that are using hemp and have, have done press releases, they need three to six months supply to know, you know, before they, before they even start that they have a supply of three to six months worth of the the hemp fiber, right, that they can manufacture. Um, and so it really is, it's that capital injection that someone's going to sit on some pretty hefty product before they're willing to buy. But the buyers are out there. I yeah. mean, and everyone that I talk to that's a U.S.-based company is looking to bring their complete manufacturing back to the United States. It's just, we've got to catch up. We've got to get people growing. And Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we've been talking, uh, one of our partners is working with us to do a pilot program in Puerto Rico. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things that we talked about was, okay, so I, I grow, a, they could do, I think it's four or five seasons down there yeah. with their growing conditions. So it's just going to be a factory for hemp. But um, they, so you grow all this stuff in, in Puerto Rico. Well, how do you get it back to the mainland? It's an island. You know, I mean, it's not like you can fly it. I mean, that would be a, a crazy expensive and you can't really truck it. So you got to put it in a container and ship it. And if, if that, that shipping market isn't there or that, that vehicle. I mean, imagine being pulled over by, by us coast guard, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a very real possibility. And then all of a sudden like, no, 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 I swear it's hemp. Don't arrest me. It's hemp. You know I mean? It's, it's, it's a risk that you, you take with doing that. But it, at the same time, you know, we'll see um, what people do and, and where things go, but that's where we're hoping things go is, is um, a good problem to have, right. Is, all of a sudden they, they start seeing hemp. They go, oh, that's hemp. I got it. You know. Okay. So I have a question then, because I think this is part of where a lot of our uh, legislation and lobbying is going and concern is there aren't the education. You said it well, when we were talking about your contact for transportation, um, every time you go in, you're having to educate what it is, what it does, how, where it goes, what problems are there so that they know how to, how to implement a program like yours or a system like yours, right? Because they're just not even aware that you can't, <laughs> you have to test it so many places or yep. that each place has to be regulated. Um, I feel like a lot of the reason these law changes are coming down is to close the loop and prevent the risk because they don't have a solution in place to yep. solve this, right? What is, how do we bridge that gap and get ahead of everything coming down um, and closing up instead of utilizing or exploring solutions. And I understand it when it comes to risk, right? When we're talking about the risk to a large, any large organization, let alone a state or government entity, um, that's a concern. They're, they're out to protect the people. So what are your thoughts there? And it, it, It's actually almost like we scripted that, even though we didn't. But um, part of, part of what we've realized um, with our solution is so we started out we started we said we were a track and trace solution i'll kind of come come around to this right and as soon as i say track and trace everybody that's in this call that's in the cannabis space just goes because it's Same. it's brutal right and here's why so any of the companies that are that are tracking product in the cannabis space are doing it to keep it a white market product Right. So if I have a kilo that I grow and I, I send it through a, a refinement process of some kind, you know, whether it's packaging, or whatever, I need to have a kilo coming out of that. I need to have a kilo going into a dispensary or, or whatever the end outlet is. If I have half a kilo of that cannabis go missing, I now have black market product, which means I'm not getting paid my taxes. So I need as a as an agency, I need to know where that stuff is. I need to know I need to see who's not playing the playing by the rules. You know, if if I have five kilos a week go missing on my product, I know that you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing. And I can go spot check that. I mean that's that's why the 
the track and trace or even seed to sale solutions that are out there are like that because that is the way that the government is comfortable operating with that product. Right. So I, I know that I'm doing everything on the legal side. We're fine with it. We'll take the revenue. We'll take all the money. We'll, we'll do all that stuff. But it needs to be white market. You know, as soon as you do black market, it's bad. So what's different with hemp is hemp. If you if you lose a kilo out of a ton, nobody cares. You are the worst drug dealer in the world if you're stealing hemp and trying to sell it as marijuana. Right. It's kind of a self-correcting problem. I, I mean, I hate to say it, but if. If I sell someone a kilo of hemp and they go, hey, I smoked the whole bag. No. Uh, all, all my buyers are really unhappy yeah, with me. I got, I got a whole bunch of people with pitchforks and torches that are coming to your house tomorrow. I mean, it looks but, good, but. Yeah. So we, we built our system um, based on a USDA food manufacturing facility. So we're built not to track lockstep a kilo at a time. The. Frankly, the, the volume side of it, we don't care because nobody cares about the volume side. It isn't a one-to-one -one relationship. It's the ability to recall. So when we talk to people in, in government or uh, in big industries or things like that, their concerns are, well, what if I have a bad batch? What if I have uh, one plant that has some crazy toxic chemical on it that you know, somebody put into my, my CBD or whatever, and then it's dispersed because you, you mix it together in a, you know, a five gallon bucket, a 50 gallon drum, you know, pick the metric size you want. Um, but that then goes into all these little eyedropper bottles that people use. And if one of those bottles comes back with salmonella or uh, fentanyl or, you know, pick any horrible scenario that is bad, bad, bad. But they have, have, huh? It's, it's really great. Yeah. So I mean, and you, I know what people need to realize is these, this is what happens when these, track and trace or these um, systems aren't put in place to, you know, these checks and balances aren't put in place. Then we get big organizations with big power to distribute bad product. Um, years ago, uh, gold metal flour uh, had a, uh, their pancake mix, I believe it was. Somebody will spot check this and for facts, whatever, but I think it was gold metal flour had salmonella in their pancake mix, or the cake mix. Excuse me. They couldn't execute a, a detailed recall fast enough, so they pulled every product they had just to be safe because it was not worth the loss of human life. They recalled something like two or three Olympic-sized swimming pools of flour and destroyed it because there's no way you could you could use it for anything else because it was it was really? and they couldn't figure out if it's the the one pallet or the last six months of production right. because they had batch dispersion problems. So they recalled it all. Well, that killed all their production for several months because they had to get rid of all their back stock, all their inventory. Their shelf space was wide open on the shelves. So what happened? The their competitors started taking over the shelf space because it, you know, what was this wide is now this wide and out of stock. The retailers still need to make the money. Um, they had to wait until more product can show up that was clean after they did a real expensive cleanup. They ended up getting bought out by their biggest competitor because they couldn't make ends meet. Uh, the The recall, the poorly executed recall, killed that industry for them, or killed that that particular company. Um, we're when we built everything we did, we we kind of realized that that's that's potential in hemp. I mean, if you're if you're getting to the point where you're competing for shelf space, and you have a recall because of whatever reason, if you're out of stock. Uh, you know, and I have a, a retail store. I don't care that you're out of stock. I just need to sell more stuff. You know, I got I got light bills. I got, you know, car payments, mortgage payments, things like that. I need to sell more stuff to make more money. And if you're out of stock, not my problem. This is something to pay attention to again that, yeah, 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 sure. But that won't happen to me, right? But that is what's happening. And I see it happening all over from ketchup to mustard and um, paper towels and Dr. Pepper, you know, there's these big announcements that all these companies are struggling because they aren't getting packaging or bottling or labeling on because our supply chains are broken, let alone their product itself and having to fix the problem. You know, that's a that's not a huge hit. Being without a lid or, or manufacturing capabilities of your plastic bottles is a much different hit than recalling three Olympic sized swimming pools worth of product. However, it's it's that same if if you're not prepared and and 
set up to protect yourself from these um, risks and, and they're going to happen in him. You know, we're under big scrutiny. We're seeing all the time that everything is, is being ridiculed and picked apart more so than any other industry, I would say right now, yeah. um, especially as it's coming onto the shelves more and more. So, well, yeah. and with the, the talks in DC about, you know, the FDA with CBD, right? So the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, yeah. Yeah. as soon as they can put a, a rubber stamp on CBD, what do you think the first thing that the FDA is going to require anybody who's going to create CBD products going forward? Tracking. They're, they're going to require the ability to do a fast recall mm -hmm. because they don't care if you if you have to recall everything you've made the last three years or the last two weeks. It doesn't matter. It's the FDA. It's what they want to do. And to do a recall, we so one of the companies we worked with when we built our non-hemp version of this, uh, which is just called Inventory Batch Tracker, very creative names, you can tell. Hemp Batch Tracker, Inventory Batch Tracker. It, but, um, it is. Just yeah. by that. <laughs> but um, one of the things that we, we worked with the company that was um, selling beef jerky, and the way they checked in their product for beef jerky, right? Uh, I love beef jerky. If anyone, if anyone can figure out how to do hemp beef jerky or beef jerky with CBD in it or something like that, I'm all in. But this guy would check in a truckload of beef, put a post-it note with the, the detailed records on his chest, would finish unloading the truck, walk upstairs and stick it to a guy's computer. And that guy would put it into an Excel spreadsheet. Huh. So we made, the, we, made the, we made the comment like, hey, uh, guess what? Let's just play a little game. I'm the, I'm the CDC. Hey, guess what? Um, three people just died eating your beef jerky. I need to know what you shipped on last Tuesday. Like, well, that's easy. I'll just pull it up in here. Like, yeah, but he's out today sick. He, the password doesn't exist. Oh, you just deleted a field. Now, all of a sudden, all these records. Oh, and I need to know everything else that was in that box that shipped out to that guy. It, it goes from a click a button, run a report to total managed chaos. And if you can't get it fast enough and, it's, and there's potential loss of human life, nobody cares. Uh, it's sorry, you're done got a question i want to kind of break down on the state side or um legal side right what are some of the risks that you're seeing that people aren't aware of right when you go in and you talk to some of these guys and it's almost like an aha moment of oh i didn't even think about that what are some of those main keys that maybe aren't being considered or thought about that need to be taught or discussed um that hemp batch tracker solves or that a solution like this, right. Brings. Yeah. Because so, I think it's very real. And I just don't think that, I don't think the common knowledge about the problem is hmm. I mean, even down to banking. I had somebody the other day tell me I don't have a real business because we have banking concerns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the industry. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. Um, yeah. When we first got started, we talked about, um, uh, who would ride shotgun with what rifle to go get paid cash and duffel bags. And, yeah. um, you know, as a six foot three, former bouncer that owns a couple of firearms, it was me. So I was like, thanks guys. Um, but, uh, you know, the banking finally figured that out. But, um, so the, the big ones that we see when we talk to people, so there's one, there's one farmer working with in particular who, um, the guy is, he's a, he's the perfect hemp guy, right? He is, um, he's a Vietnam vet uh, who uh, I asked him what he did in the military, you know, and he goes, oh, smoke dope. I know, but what'd you do in the military? He goes, smoked a lot of dope. I'm like, well, yeah, okay. But he is the, job. <laughs> yeah. like, what was your MOS? And he's like, smoking dope. And I'm like, okay, easy. <laughs> Heard. <Gotcha. laughs> but he is, he's the, you know, the crotchety old farmer, right? <laughs> and he's got the beard and, you know, he's the little, it looks a little dirty and all that kind of stuff. And he's just, he's got con shipping containers and he is that crazy old coot that you love. Um, but is the same kind of guy that would put a round over your head if you showed up too late at his property. I mean, he, he doesn't care. So he, he grew cannabis in Hawaii legally years ago. And I mean, he's, he's one of those guys that has been in the industry and he knows his stuff and he can, he does a cool mix of hybrid and, and dirt with uh, hydroponics and dirt and guy can grow anything is in it for the, the passion of it and wants to play around with it. 
he is the guy that we are really worried about will get popped as the poster child for who is not a compliant hemp producer in the state. Um, because he's the guy that would that is an old guy, right? So he's, I don't even want to wager a guess because he probably punched me the next time I see him, to be honest. But he's the guy that he would, they go, let me see your records. And they, you know, he has the, his hemp license taped to the door of his house. Well, he's worried about what a lot of people are worried about, which is being um, illegal, right? I'm growing hemp that there's a point where it becomes not hemp. And I, I'm mean, not in a state where it's legal to do this. And, you know, the fear is getting arrested or getting raided, you know, which is interesting because under the law, you can still grow hot hemp. You just have to destroy it. Right. But you're, but people are worried, well, I'm going to grow hot. I'm going to get arrested. Well, you know, if that's a concern, that's fine. Be, you know, be, be smart. Don't be stupid. But he has his license taped to his door. And I said, you know, Mark, I said, if I walk in here and I'm a, and I'm a cop that you're afraid of, and I really want to bind you up just because I personally don't believe in hemp and I think you're doing something wrong. And I pull that, that label off and stick it in my pocket. Where's your copy of your hemp license? It's right there. I don't see anything in that door. Well, it was there two minutes ago. So the, the detailed records and all that kind of stuff, we as a tracking company give you a digital version of that. So if that, that, scary raid does show up and that's why we're tracking his product right now is because we really want somebody um, to call the, the DEA or the FBI or the local police or um, the USDA or somebody call somebody and go, he is non-compliant, go bust him. And they will show up with cameras and they will probably be a little assertive with him and which he will probably throw a punch. He is the guy that will probably get punched several times in the face, put in handcuffs, dragged out, kicking and screaming and we'll make the national news as here's this crazy hemp farmer fighting police, fighting camera crews, and you know, just and it's just the way he is, it's just the guy's personality. It's not that he's a bad person, it's just he's that he's he's like a, a lovable, cantankerous old man that you gotta kind of hang out with to know him. But he now has the ability with our system to basically go, Hey, you know what? Cool, glad you guys are here. Go ahead and scan this. And they scan a QR code and it pulls up everything. He is currently tracking the pH of his water, the the inputs that he puts into his, his field. He makes a um, stinging nettle uh, distilled fertilizer that's 100% organic that has all these different things. I mean, he makes his own soil. I mean, he is PhD level smart when it comes to growing this product. And now he's tracking all of it. So when someone goes, hey, you're out of compliance, I'm busting you for an FDA violation. He can pull up a phone, hand him a, a sticker, and it's all there. Well, the I, think, I think I think something that's important is what what when you when you come to that that happens to everybody when you're and moving you're city or state to the next and different demographics and different seeds and different genetics, it changes when things peak. And if the state gets backed up from when they're coming out to test and now you have a hot product at versus, you know, the intent is really a key piece. And that's what I see is so valuable for the state's benefit, right? I, I understand very much the benefit as the consumer or the farmer or the grower, but being able to fix this problem for the state or the government side is really where I see a solution that has to be talked about, right? Is they right away can pull records or know where people are at, where's, yeah. you know, where, where are they getting product? And me as a manufacturer, for example, would know exactly, the state would know exactly which farms I grew, you know, I pulled each product from. Yep. I, you know, if I need to go back and say, okay, I've got bad product or I've got a product that's testing heavy in metals. And now I can go back and identify which farm specifically out of the five farms I purchased from. Um, that's a big value add at mitigating risk for our state. And, and it's a PR difference too. I mean, so imagine, I mean, we've all seen the stories of uh, XYZ uh, company, did a horrible recall and they're, they're not making anything. And then they come out real sheepishly that like two days they're like, well, we found out that on Friday the 13th, we, you know, and it's just this, it's, you're, you just, you scream at your TV. Like you're an idiot. Like, how can you do that? You're a terrible business person. Right. But imagine the flip side of that is the CDC call says, Hey, uh, Mandy, you've got a contaminated product. You need out of the market right now. Cool. No problem. I'm going to jump on Facebook live real fast. 
Hey everybody, this is Mandy. I we just found out or made aware that we have a contaminated product. It came from farm from Dave Johnson's farm in in little corner county of whatever state. Uh, it was harvested on the 14th of September. It moved to this location at this point. Was into these products. Anything that has this batch number on it needs to be returned to us immediately, and we will send you a refund. That's the best company in the world. I want to buy everything from those guys. Like, send me more product because that's somebody that cares about me as a consumer versus somebody's like, look, just we don't care. Just don't eat it. <laughs> how, does this, how does this work as a resource for, say, a government entity or a large entity, uh, say, even an association, right, that anybody could come back and say, hey, I want to verify this product. I want to check this product as a buyer, right? We get any of these big buyers, say we get Patagonia that comes in and they say, hey, I want to know, or uh, let's go back uh, to the health and wellness side more around some of these big MLMs, right? And they want to know they're looking to buy big volume of either distillate or isolate and, or uh, even a a hemp flower crude, right? And then they're going to manufacture themselves, but it's coming from all over. They now can go back and pull records from my understanding and know the statistics on that farm, right? So both on the consumer safety and the buyer safety, this solves a lot of, of, of problems, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it also goes as far as, um, so everyone in this industry is concerned about being a, an ethical person or being a good person, right? Sure. Um, and it's part of the community, right? We all want to do business with good people. So if, if somebody is telling me that, hey, I've got this product and they're misrepresenting any number of facts, right? The way that you, I mean, I'm a former bouncer. So I, I, I call people on lies all the time when I was bouncing. I loved it. I was also an art student. So, you know, someone hand me a fake idea. Like, look, the resolution on your, your printer is terrible. Up the resolution. The background colors off by at least four shades of magenta. Just fix this and come back next week. And, you know, people just kind of look at me like, uh, you can't do that. So, um, but the way that you, you vet somebody, you know, if, if you come to me and you ask me a factual data point that I can validate, Hey, is this truly what, what, what you're selling me? Yeah, I can prove it. I don't, I'm not offended by that because I'm a good person. I'm a good business person. I want to do ethical business. And I would much rather have somebody go, hey, prove it to me and then prove it to them. Then somebody go, hey, can you prove it to me? Like, uh, maybe let me find, I think I got the thing where. We've got to wait for our, our office manager to get in. She has all the passwords. Yeah. And then, then she'll get me into that document that someone shared. That credibility goes from here to here in two seconds. And, you know, our platform, we, we kind of realized it uh, when we first started talking to, to Chris Fontes, um, that we are kind of a bad broker's nightmare, um, which is why we like Chris, because Chris does things the right way. And he now owes me five dollars. But um, <laughs> uh, for all these plugs. <laughs> yeah, Chris. Yeah, it's we're just going to pay pallet. You know, it's not a big deal. But um, but. Chris, you know, we talked to Chris at one point and we realized that if you're an unethical broker and you're the, the person that's, I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who has some product, um, you, as a, as the person buying or selling, you'll prove it. And with our platform, you can't. And if you can't prove it, then all of a sudden this, these people are, you know, absolutely not loving life because we can poke holes in their argument all day long just because it's data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys are so, awesome. Well, and I think that this is exactly what this industry needs, right? And we've been talking about this since the beginning is until these type of systems come into place and understanding what the pain points were, um, it was hard to implement them. And no discredit to anybody that is still running on a Excel spreadsheet or, um, you know, entering passwords. We all started there, right? But when we talk about being able to scale and enter real business, this this is part of it. And same same to how close do you work with like GMP um, companies? You're reading my mind. So okay. we're we're in the process of uh, vetting our solution as a full laboratory limb software. Uh, we've got one university that we're starting with, and another one that we will probably start with here in the next uh, month or two. Um, so we'll be a hemp specific limb platform, uh, for that. 
we have been sitting in on every GMP conversation we can, which the first thing that everyone in GMP says is you need to document your stuff. And every time I, I, you know, I'm a good loaded question person. So I say, Hey, how are you documenting? Do you recommend documenting this information? Like, I mean, Excel, Google docs, really anything. And it's not, you know, Google doc is great. We use Google docs for a lot of things that we do, but they're not a searchable database with hard links to the things that you need. So, um, but yeah, so if, if you're trying to get to GMP compliance, we actually just worked with a, a company out of um, Arkansas. They did a full gap audit. Um, in Arkansas, they were the one company that went down the hemp version of this versus the marijuana version of this. And their gap audit came back because they're trying to be GMP compliant. And they're trying to be um, a, a big national brand, which is awesome for them. Uh, their biggest hole in their, their, their audit was uh, they don't document their data as much as they need to. And um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I want to connect you with someone, David, at the GMP Collective. He was on one of our calls. His group, um, he's got a big group of advisors uh, nationally that I think this would be very valuable. You know, your organization it would be very valuable for them. And then also on the insurance side, I'm curious about. You know, we talk about risk for insurance and a lot of these big insurance companies Yes, there's insurance policies out there, but they're astronomically expensive. All of them exclude or a lot of them exclude hemp. Some of them have, you know, surrounding crop coverage or uh, they're, it's just not practical. And when I went and met with one of the largest, um, one of the largest insurance companies nationally just the other day, they're looking to write policies, but having a hard time understanding what are the risks on the farm side? Is this something that they can now use or collaborate with to be able to write policies to protect our farmers and our manufacturing facilities? 100%. So I, I was asked to speak um, at the Iowa Power Farming Show, which is it's like 40 or 50 acres of ag under roof. It was insane. Um, but, um, I was asked to speak at, at one of the breakouts. And, um, so I got up there to talk about hemp and, uh, it was great. Cause I said, all right, so who in here is growing hemp and nobody raised their hand. I'm like who in here wants to grow hemp and nobody raised their hand. I'm like, what the hell are you guys doing in here? And we went around the room cause there were, you know, 20 people like, yeah. uh, crop insurance, crop insurance, crop insurance, crop insurance, crop insurance, crop insurance. Every single person in that breakout was an insurance broker for crop insurance because, they need to be able to validate with data and, and tracking of that data and that, that growth cycle, what is going on in that field and what's happening. And, you know, cause they need to be able to approve or deny a claim. Yep. So, well, if, and, and to write the policy to support and protect the farmer, right? What I'm hearing a lot is, you know, the risk of, they could write a policy say for drought because some crops are heavy, you know, are, are drought risk, where I'm not sure that cannabis does have the drought risk. But, you know, what about when it gets hot or freeze? You know, the damage that happens at a, at a late freeze, like in Colorado this year, it pretty much crushed a lot of their crops. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, with Iowa recently, I mean, you've got the, the giant grain bins that you see yeah. the landscape are crushed like beer cans. Uh, the corn crop this year, I mean, I saw crops that had, had come back from the initial blowdown that there wasn't a single ear of corn on them because it got stripped off by the 120 mile an hour winds and it was folded up and it looked, I mean, it looked more like a yucca plant than it did a corn plant. And I don't, honestly don't know how some of these farmers are going to recover from that. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm wondering. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the data set of that and how to, how to understand that. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier with the government side of it. Um, we don't charge the government for a license to see our system because they're basically running a report, which is no drag on what we do. Um, we also do it. So um, I was talking to another state still in the early stages, but um, they, they were like, well, yeah, but what's this cost? I'm like, it doesn't cost you anything. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm not going to charge you a dime to use this software. Well, how do you pay for it? The people who use the, the system will pay for it with their subscriptions because they're getting a benefit of increased value and trackability and uh, you know, good business practices and things like that. It's security. 
If yeah. I can prove my intent, you know, when I go back and I read some of these rules and especially things coming down from like the DEA is our intent. If you can prove intent that you're growing hemp is very different than cannabis, even when you're at that 1% threshold, yeah. right? And like you said earlier, it's not illegal to grow hemp. The product becomes, yeah, you have to destroy it after it becomes hot, yeah. right? And and mitigating that and understanding that. And, and again, I think it comes back to that solution of where did I intend and where did I go wrong? What happened? And identifying that, was it a plot of land? You know, yeah. and I'm sure on the farmer side, when we talk about consumer cost, you know, can a farmer track down to acreage or plots of land? And yeah, if, if you want to do an R&D field, you can track to an individual plant and you don't have to use an RFID tag. That's the So everyone's like, I don't want to buy RFID tag. I'm like, we don't need RFID tags. Well, you need RFID tags. No, I, we don't need RFID tags. It's hemp. I mean, go put an RFID tag on a field of fiber. Go, go grow 400 acres of fiber hemp and tell me where to put the RFID tag. I dare you. Um, <laughs> but but that that tracking system and that that ability to, to see all that takes away the gut feeling. Like, I feel like this is what I did last year, so I should do it again. And a lot of times hard data will tell you to do the opposite of your gut because the data doesn't lie. It's it's it doesn't care. So when we talk to state agencies, the, the other thing we run into is um, places that aren't super hemp friendly or cannabis friendly. Um, the one thing that nobody wants to do is pay for it with their tax dollars, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to pay tax money for these reefer madness people and these, these terrible, horrible people that are just growing medicine. I don't want to pay for them with my tax dollars. We're honestly the only platform that goes, cool, you don't have to. The, the people that are going to use it will be the ones that will fund it. Uh, your budgets are shot to hell with uh, with COVID right now. Don't worry about it. You don't have to pay for it. We got it. Uh, we're actually, one of our partnerships, we're, we're, we're charging them $1 because their guidelines are such they have to have um, a payment. So we're charging them $1. We're going to give them two nineteen thirty seven half dollars because that's when the Marijuana Tax Act passed. And they're going to ceremoniously pay us with to 1937 half dollars that we're going to give them so that we can have the, the photo op with these two coins. So, sure. Well, I think that this is, I know that in Utah, this is a point of, of conversation often and the, the cost effectiveness um, is a huge point of contention when we talk about RFID tags. And I've heard on some of these systems, you're being charged every time that's that, you know, tag is scanned or you pay for it. And then really how, who's to say that you don't take that right off of the, the box and put it on something else. Yeah. And now, now my crop of 90 pounds or 90,000 pounds of smokable hemp flour is actually RFID tagged to 90,000 pounds of premium yeah. cannabis. And that's, and that's the hard part. I mean, it's uh, people did make the same thing with um, blockchain. Uh, blockchain is an awesome tool. We've, uh, we've played with the, the concept of it, but blockchain works great for cryptocurrency because it's intangible. I can't go in and change a Bitcoin hash. I, there's no point to it, right? It, it devalues my crypto at that point. But with blockchain and tangible goods, um, a good, so we actually talked to some, some PhD level guys that wrote a paper out of um, Switzerland and the UK um, where they had an example that was great that I love, which is if I want to put, uh, a physical blockchain thing and put a sensor in the back of a truck that registers that that truck was kept at 70 degrees. If I'm a bad actor, I go out and buy a 99 cent styrofoam cooler, put a little fan in there and super glue it around that, that sensor. Well, it keeps it at 70 degrees, but that sensor doesn't know that the, the rest of the semi truck is 120 degrees baking in the sun, but right. because of the blockchain, it's there. The, the other big one, especially in this industry, that's a, a big fearful point is genetics. If, if I create a genetic plant that just, let's just the unicorn, it can never go hot no matter what you do to it. If somebody with deeper pockets and better traction to get onto a blockchain can get my genetic material by buying a seed, which is what I'm probably doing is selling seeds. If they can get my genetics into their blockchain before I can get my genetics into that blockchain, they own it for the rest of eternity. 
I hope people are listening and just heard you because that's a huge thing when we talk about genetics and IP addresses and how do you patent cannabis. Um, I hadn't even considered this being what you just said hadn't crossed my mind yet, I guess, when we talk about the money piece, yes, the track and trace piece, yes, but the understanding that your genetics and how do you own that genetic and how do you keep people from picking it up and tampering with it is you really have to have a a system like blockchain that allows you to protect or understand exactly what each step of the process is, right? And be able to visibly share it. And the, the, the system that we're using has been used in banking for decades. And truthfully, it's not a high value target for hackers because it's not a something you can hang your hat on. Hey, I hack some blockchain. So, um, but the other thing too is, um, I mean, we've, we've talked about it a little bit, but one of the, the big differences here, I keep forgetting I'm bald. <laughs> I, I shaved my head about two, three years ago. And so now it's gap certification. All right, we'll get that. Um, but the, the big thing is always cost, right? How much does it cost? And, and when you talk about the systems that are in place for most people's frame, frame of reference, um, it's a subscription, it's RFID tags, it's reports. It's, I mean, it, they, they nickel and dime you and we don't want to do that. We don't care. Um, the value to us is being in the marketplace and, and working with states and, and other things to provide the data sets to build the infrastructure that will happen because hemp is the first crop ever that has gone from illegal to legal in a hundred years or more. I mean, the only, the only other thing I can think of that's even remotely close would be alcohol during prohibition and then it's back, you know? So, um, so we will charge farmers $20 per acre per year, which is nothing. I mean, if you're a one acre farmer, you know, to, to get out of a hundred thousand dollars in legal fees, that's, that's worth it in my opinion. Um, processors that that are working with contracts and farmers and all that we charge $17 per licensed acre per farmer so you can you as a farmer can see what your processor is doing or your extractor is doing with your product after you've delivered it to them the processor extractor can then see what the farmer is doing in the field so if there is a problem early on you have direct line of sight into each other's data you can communicate you can work out things you can you can make better data driven decisions because you're connected through that data set. And um, so it's fun like that. But for as far as gap, sorry, I'll jump back around. But as far as the gap side of it, um, good agricultural practices, good, um, uh, and even the, the regular gap audit that people are used to, they're both boil down to the same thing. So you have to have a standard operating procedure or procedure. And typically it's a notebook of some kind that, you know, here's, here's our procedure. Um, yeah, good echo. Yeah. Um, but when you get into that world, it's all about if X, then Y, right? It's that correlation of what you do and how that works. And um, if if this happens, how do you handle that? So in a lab space, when you're not talking about the agricultural side, they will have three ring binders that are this thick of every possible contingency and all that. Um, the way that you then validate that is by tracking those, those points along the way. So um, some things, you know, like in a lab setting, if you're testing for potency, you might have five to 10 data points that you have to put in um, at different steps along the way from the time it's received to the time that the COA ships out. Um, with agriculture, it's different and different states, different requirements. Um, when in doubt, if there's an easy platform, which we, we like to think that we have, uh, the more data you can put in there, the better it is uh, because it's, it's more robust. You can then see contingencies you didn't even know about uh, pop up and, and solve them. So, what about what a bit, a bit or, or, the, or say an ex, a lab to be able to see um, trends? Now that is data science, which is a whole different ball game, which is where we came from. So, the predictive side of data um, and the analytic side of data, the data visualization is is what what our parent company's done for twelve years. Um, so that side of things is where, where we really are, are eager to get to that point because we'll be able to do things, um, predict different levels of, uh, any number of, I mean, God, I'm being really vague here. I'm trying to get something. So a good example is, um, we're working with a company that's doing some telehealth for, uh, uh, medicinal, medicinal use. Um, and they're starting with hemp. 
So they will have a data set of all their, their patients, which there's HIPAA compliance. There's also HIPAA compliant data. Um, so that HIPAA data, HIPAA compliant data we'd have access to. Uh, they're also working with veterans. So you have service records. And then on top of that, you also have um, any pre-existing conditions or anything like that with VA um, or any any claims they may have filed. So in a perfect world, there's a lot of moving pieces there. And I know someone's screaming right now. Um, but in a perfect world, if, if all that data can be HIPAA compliant, which it can be, you just have to strip out certain parts, you would be able to predict uh, a veteran who went to Afghanistan, who was 242 days in country, uh, spent more than 26% of his time at a forward operating base or under direct fire, has a 72.4% chance of PTSD. And because of their age and because they're in Georgia, in this county, the access to health care and the access to those things means that they will have a higher than likely chance of suicide. Therefore, you should put them on medication, get them taking hemp or cannabis and, and outreach and talk to them more hands on. Um, that sounds absolutely insane to people when you think about it, but those overlapping data points, even if you're 60% accurate, that's somebody's life that you could save. And, and that's and, what we want to do at the state is here's how you do better hemp, you know. And reality and is this, this the technology, the technology is there, there. It's available for us. It's not like it's, yes, it seems crazy and hard to wrap your mind about around as far as capabilities, but the data is there. It's a matter of having a company like yours with experience like yours to be able to put it together and say, oh, we can relate all of these other practices or experiences and all these other industries and they relate into hemp right it, i mean it's same with tech a lot of the technology even for the extraction process is coming over to the hemp industry right yeah. and i think that this isn't new not reinventing the wheel it's just adapting a little bit into what the needs are and understanding those yeah. um uh, I I would love to connect you with David Rockwood. I saw he made some comments and was listening. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to, to connect with him, but he uses a satellite technology to pull oh. some different data. Um, I'm really excited to potentially do a carbon footprint, um, pull some data on carbon footprint. And mm -hmm. he's got some great technology on that also. Yeah. What's your... We've, so be, because we own the intellectual property on the, the back end tracking of this, um, we've... We've talked to a Dutch shipping company about running all their fleet on seed oil rather than bunker fuel to generate carbon credits that they can then turn around and sell in the open market to offset uh, some of the costs they have. And um, the only way they can do that is if they track it. And so um, the, the things that we have in the wings uh, from our, our parent company standpoint down to the, the different legs and all that, um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. And I get a play around in those different areas at different times. But right now the focus is definitely on the hemp side of it because uh, hemp needs it more than anything else. And we would rather be, be the incumbent that has a solution that actually listens to the people using it and takes direct feedback and says, you're right, that's a stupid feature. We'll get that gone tomorrow. Um, versus somebody who's just being a pest in the, in the industry. That's what we want to do. Well, and I think that that's the big difference, right? Data, it doesn't lie pay attention to the numbers and what works. Um, there's a lot of really passionate people that get very emotional about this industry and about what's happening. And sometimes it's just not worth the fight or we have to redirect. But I, um, yeah, I think that it would be a great connection to connect with David. And um, I'd love to see where it can go because I, I, I believe probably more or as much as you do that this is, this is really going to change the industry and it's going to take the data to walk into somebody that it's not a belief. It's not a passion anymore. These are our facts and, and, and here we show it. And data is a, is a great jumping off point because hemp, hemp and cannabis is a passionate industry. Everyone that I've ever met is passionate. You can't be in this space and not have a passion for it. Uh, the stories that people have, I mean, I, I think I've seen you cry on this twice talking to people. Um, but uh, and I won't make a cry. But. I'm wearing a speak for the trees shirt today. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, passion is great, but passion, when someone doesn't understand your passion, can lead to conflict and yelling and why aren't you understanding and, and that kind of feeling, which is confrontational, which people back away from. We're not a confrontational society anymore. 
data uh, and proving it with data and, and third party data. Like we, we as a company made a decision that we will never grow our own product because it puts us on. So we, we speak to, to the lawmakers and we speak to the, the producers. So we have to speak both languages, right? And as soon as we, we put ourselves uh, to where we can grow our own product, then we lose that valid um, that, val that validity with the lawmakers and things like that. So when we go in and talk to them, like, look, you have X number of people doing this that are needing a remediation facility to meet this new DEA guideline, or we need this facility built here and subsidized by the state to bring you X number of dollars in the next year. Um, I mean, it's something where that data is, is what they need and they, they are more open to listening to data because that's what they're going to regurgitate when they get elected. Okay. So I, I need some serious conversations with you because uh, this is, this is where we lean on people like you and companies like your, you within this association so that we can make changes to benefit the industry. Right. Um, so understanding what those are, I would love to, yeah. to pick up. Well, and if you're I lean, hold on. I just got this the other day. My strain cane. Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, what is this? This is uh, from, there's a company called Strain Canes, um, and the the people that run it are awesome. Uh, but it is uh, this is a Boss Hog High Country Genetics cannabis stock that's turned into a walking stick. Okay, I need one of those. Yeah, I'm gonna look I, had, I had to have one, and it, we've we put them on the blog and we found it randomly, like Facebook algorithm or something like that. But I bought this thing, and it weighs next to nothing. Uh, it's a great. I mean, I, I have a bad knee. Perfect. We, we go hiking a lot up at Zion for Angel's Landing and stuff. And we're always fighting for sticks, but um, we need to put one of those on Sarah's website also. Yeah, I think I connected Sarah to that. These okay, guys good. as well. I took them off that, that you guys may may want to have them on, but uh, yeah. he's a super awesome guy and, and uh, did that custom. Okay. So you can reach out and custom request it. So I, I told him I wanted something, a strain that was, that was pretty cool. And uh, he, he definitely delivered. I mean, it's it's lightweight and strong like you'd expect from him, but I'm stoked. Yeah. I love it. Love they it. Put love crystals it. in there too. So if you want to go full Gandalf, you can do that as well. My girlfriend called me Gandalf a lot walking with that. So I do <laughs> for the trees <laughs> <laughs> and I will use it. So it's good. Yeah. And I'm tall like you. So I'm going to need a custom. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate having you on. Um, I'd love to move this conversation forward. Um, I'll let's connect maybe later today. I've got a group I'd love to, to chat with and maybe draw you in on some conversations. Also as much um, involved in some of these steering committees where these are really being addressed on a larger scale, both uh, specific to Utah and on the national level. Yeah, I think, it's just getting, I think getting everyone on the same page is, is going to be really vital to this. And then, you know, the the more that you can rely on data because people people think the the things that people get swayed by are the data visualization pieces so being able to to take what is essentially a spreadsheet and make it a, a pie chart sounds easy but making it in a meaningful way uh, only comes if you have good data and that's where we're we're stepping up to fill that void in the hemp space and we we, we love working with people that are passionate about it because they when they start wrapping their heads around it uh the 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 data points and things that come out of it are crazy. We've got um, Tim Harms, who's with uh, Harvest 360 Labs. Yeah. Um, he's been working with us on some different things, and and he now is at the point where he's like, well, "What are you doing with the data? Where's the data? Do you have the data? Do you have, how do you track that? How do you do this?" He is. I mean, he's a big pharma guy turned um, hemp cannabis advocate, and he's doing all kinds of cool stuff. And I think he's got. I think you should have his email too if you guys want to ever have him on. But he. Uh, he's a good dude, but he has turned into a data monster. I have to rein him in a couple times. It's mean like, easy. <laughs> well, this is where my wheels are turning because I'm with you that this is what we need in order to bridge the gap, to be able to have the conversation with the people that are making the decisions that are not deep in with experience, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big difference. It's a lot of the people we talk to have, a, have personal experience. And so they're very passionate because they know, right? These other people are hearing and they just, but facts and numbers are going to speak a completely different language. So I'd love to explore what that looks like in the meantime, and we're at, out of time, but how do people get in touch with you, Justin, if they have questions or want to get involved or use your software? Yeah. So um, we actually have a, a link for the uh, Utah CBD collective where the, anyone who signs up through that gets 10% off. 
Um, all the stuff is on the website, obviously. And then um, if you want to uh, get hold of me, it's just Justin at hempbatchtracker.com. Um, you know, I'm a software guy, so I'm not out in the field all day. So if you need to get hold of me, I will probably see the email come in unless I'm out grabbing lunch or something. But, um, you know, we, we are talking to anybody and everybody that will listen because we are a sponge looking for water. And, um, you know, if somebody has a uh, use for data or has a need for it um, or has a, a use case that they think might, might not work, I mean, we, we talked to a dryer company. You know, a hemp drying equipment company, and they're they're like, yeah, we totally need this. There's tons of data we need to track, and we're like, with drying hemp, like it really like moisture content, like oh no, and they went through the whole list. And it was just like, oh yeah, well we can track that. So, Something that I'm curious about is like the input, the reports from, uh, and I don't know what they're called specifically. You're gonna know, but when um, during extraction process, whether it's taken wet or dried the t testing the product prior and then each stage between so that you can show what the full cannabidiol profile that's being mm. taken and all of, I'm curious about what that looks like on a true testing level. Um, uh, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. If, if you don't know what it looks like, it looks like a nightmare. <laughs> and that's why, <laughs> that's why I, I keep my, my tech guys as happy as possible with <laughs> as much pizza parties and booze and, Rounds of golf. I mean, whatever they want, they get it because they they are doing the hard work that would drive me insane. So, okay, uh, you have a tech person at your company, treat them right because they'll treat you right and find you millions of dollars long term. So true that. One more uh, shout out. Anybody wants to join our event next Thursday? I wish that you were in town, Justin, and you're welcome to come out. But we're doing a trap shoot. Hours. Not a lot of traffic right now. Hey, we may be good, but there's a, a trap shoot event. Um, Wasatch Wing and Clay, I added the link. Go ahead and register. Feel free to share. Um, it is an executive level breakfast and trap shoot to get together with the industry before we can't anymore. So I I would absolutely love doing that. So I've got a design yeah. background. So I industrial design, so I was a product designer out of college. So I I shoot trap, and for those of you who shoot trap will find this odd. Uh, but I shoot trap with an AK 47 12 gauge. <laughs> That's awesome, actually. <laughs> so it's um, I hunt turkey with it. I hunt ducks and geese and sporting clays and all that kind of stuff. And I, I pull it out. And like, you can't do that. Like, yeah, you can. It's 12 gauge. And they. Oh, my gosh. OK. Called a Saiga 12. So if anyone's looking for something that will work anywhere and everywhere, that's, that's, that's it. OK. Well, it may be my own uh, my new home defense weapon. <laughs> <laughs> if you can find them. So, but yeah, we at some point, we'll definitely get down there. And because it's. Okay. Utah's well, beautiful, and, and everybody we've met through through you guys have been awesome. So, I'd love to come out and visit you guys. I'd really like to see the industrial spot. I'd really like to see the Midwest. Um, you know, true. So we really don't have a lot of industrial or a lot of uh, fiber growing. So I'd love to come out where it really is growing like weeds <laughs> in your yeah, backyard. I mean, you you can't throw a rock and not hit it. I I actually was curious to see if I could. Uh, uh, see, I knew I liked Chris for a reason, uh, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, you can't. I actually was curious how far I'd have to go from my house downtown in Omaha to find feral hemp. And I think when I was walking my dog, there was one growing behind a dumpster. So it's just. It really is there. But I was I was meaning before uh, events are no longer allowed right now. There's they're restricted. But before we spike or peak at all, um, you know, I feel like this is maybe one more hurrah before. Or if I'd like to say it won't, but chances are good with flu season coming, things are going to slow down quite a bit. Events are going to come to a halt. Not only that, but cold weather, right? We've got, this is a great time before Wasatch Wing and Clay gets really busy for pheasant hunting and the cold weather. So yep. please join. I'd love to have you guys. Uh, Justin, we'll be in touch here pretty soon. I'd love to really brainstorm some ways sure. that we can utilize the data and what as an association we can do to support. And then to touch base with, um, you know, how the Midwest is doing as far as association wise and what we can do to support. You. Yeah. I mean, everybody's, everybody's looking for the right way to do it. And, and it's yeah. just a question of talking to the right people and answering the phone when somebody has a good idea. And that's 90% of the business is just showing up. Sure. So, I have seen a lot of uh, conversation and a lot of great people around tables making movement. And so um, that, that excites me. I'm glad to see, I hope you're involved. I'm assuming that you are, but if, again, if you need anything, call her at me we'll be in touch other than a COVID free environment. So we can get out and play, play with our friends more often, you know, and do all that kind of fun stuff. 
Yes, yes. Well, sooner than later. Yeah. Okay. We'll see you later, Justin. Thank you. Thanks again. See you, everybody. See you. Bye-bye.